Well, I want to start off by saying that in case um, I have a lot to cover today, and in case I forget, I want to appreciate, uh, let you know I really appreciate the committee asking me to speak. And I think it was probably, I don't know Brad's in the room, it was probably four or five years ago, right? Because the COVID happened, and, um, you know, I thought, sigh of relief, I got out of it, and uh, COVID ended, so what was I going to do? Anyhow, somebody said earlier in the week, you've had a lot of years to prepare for this. And I'm like, well, oh, thanks for the pressure. <laughs> so Vincy's been doing that um, to me. So uh, she keeps coming up and saying she really enjoys me speaking. I'm like, don't tell me that the day before, so, uh, or the morning of. But yeah, I, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate how well um, God has brought all the talks together. I, I, I had no idea what um, John was going to say yesterday. and. You know, so when I prepared talking about um, what I did, I, I had no idea. It just, again, continues to, since I've been involved in the gathering, is on the committee, you know, um, I remember spending a lot of time, um, you know, trying to we would figure out the speakers and then figure out, you know, what order they should be in and what their subjects are and everything else, and then God took care of everything. <laughs> Regardless of whether we did it right or not, God is always taking care of it. So today, there's a, um, there's a lot of things about, I mean, there, there's a lot about Saul that I would have loved to cover, and I would challenge anybody, there's just gems throughout all the scriptures, while well, there's, you know, the, the stories are pretty incredible um, that, you know, we are told about a lot of the events in Saul's life, I mean, from beginning to end, and that's what sort of makes it tough to cover and put all the verses up here and Obviously, you can sit at home and read your scriptures, and so trying to pick those things out um, has been a bit of a challenge. And of course, I also want to thank my wife because she heard me whining and complaining several times. And why did they pick me? And what's wrong? And anything else, honey, you want me to say? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I covered most of it. So it again, it's it's been a great journey studying and, and learning, and um, and so for for that, I'm thankful. So, turning points, just for those who may have just got here, we've talked a lot about the history of Benjamin. You know, Kish was a, kind of a fascination to me, like, you know, how did they worship, what's the background of the Benjamites. And one thing, too, and I don't know if that will come out here, but uh, Saul, whose name was changed to Paul, was also a Benjamite. Um, always interesting. Um, what his family names of that, or you know whether that name obviously must have been redeemed to use it again um, as a Benjamite. I'm, I'm not sure; it doesn't really say it to us. But so we see Samuel's story is um, a wonderful story. It kind of leads up to Saul coming on the scene, and um, you know I love the story of Elkanah and Hannah and their uh, worship and the family going up every year, regardless of the circumstances. And I think that's something. You know, we've talked about here, we don't know how bad it's going to get for us. Um, truly, when I look at the history of the, the battles that were fought, you know, I, I, Cindy and I were watching some of the shows on history, and I'm just amazed of what it must have been like to be a common person. And, and I think we bear that out because they're oftentimes they're afraid of Samuel, they're afraid of David coming, they're afraid, you know, in other words, is this again, is somebody come and take all our stuff? And, kill us and kill our families and, you know, um, just the constant raiding and, you know, the history in, Brit in Britain and the Roman Empire, you know, they, were, they would go and they would take, um, every, you know, they got their wealth by robbing people and I, today we call that business, right? <laughs> we go and we grow a business and a lot of people make a lot of money and I, I, I always wonder, at least to me, one thing that I enjoy doing is trying to figure out what the equal of today is on some of these things, whether it's idol worship, you know, I always say one of my favorite stories is God says, you know, they take this wood, they make firewood, they make a tool and everything else, then they make an image out of it and bow down and think it does something for them. And it just, I hate to say the word hilarious, but it's got to be hilarious to God to see somebody standing in front of it, thinking it, it will do something for you, and you're praying to it. And we know it angers him, but at the same time, just got to shake your head at that. And then, so what's that equal today? So... Um, you know, Saul wins the, the first battle that he goes into. He praises God. Um, he prophesies. He starts off very well, it seems like. And I believe with all my heart, God has said, and we'll talk a little bit about that today, God has set Saul up to win, to succeed 
as king. And I think that's true of everybody in this room, and maybe even those who are denying being in this room, and I don't mean denying being, or, or, or kind of decided not to. I think God's still putting things in front of you, and it's, do you see them or not? I think that's the story of Saul, because I think everybody in the room, I, I know Brother Curtis came up to you, he goes, you realize that's us, right? And so sometimes we're good, and sometimes we're not, but hopefully um, we finish with that. But so there, there's just so there's just so much many jewels in there, and I thank everybody for their feedback. I did change my slides up a little bit today. We'll see how it goes, whether it messes me up or. Um, but I've had a lot of great feedback, and I, that I appreciate too. So we're going to look at Saul's final battle, but I, I want to look at a couple things before um, you know, sort of a turning point that I feel like was a turning point in Saul's life that that made things even worse for him. Um, we'll look at the encounters with David, and um, you know, maybe you know, I can't tell you what your takeaways are, but I can tell you a few of, of what mine are. So here's to be the biggest turning point that I think, um, that at least for now, that I can see that really causes um, Saul's rage, his anger, his jealousy, the things that he faces, all out of words, right? So what is the the saying when you're a kid, sticks, anybody can say, but names will never hurt me. Well, in this case, Saul, I think, um, and of course we know names hurt us, right? But sometimes that's the worst thing is what someone says. So it says, so David went out, um, wherever Saul sent him, uh, he was very loyal to Saul. And, I, and again, I'm jumping in here in the middle of a story, but I, on purpose. And Saul sent him over all the men of war. So at this point, um, Saul thinks very highly of David. We know the story of David and Goliath. Um, and, and David was just a loyal servant. We'll see that a little bit later on um, when, when uh, Saul and David, when Saul's trying to kill David. So now what happened is they were coming home from a battle, and you can just imagine they're coming into the town, and uh, they had just slaughtered the Philistines, and David and Saul are coming into town, and the women get together, and they're singing, and um, excited and happy to see them and you know musical instruments and you know to me that would be a great scene I don't know sometimes on TV they show it and you know they're riding in on the horses and you know and everybody's cheering as they come out it's what it looked like but um, you know you kind of get that picture and so the women sang the song and danced and said and this this is the said that I think um, is was a huge turning point for Saul Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousands. Right? So everybody's read that. And then what does Saul, what happens after that? Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed only a thousand. Now what more can, they, can he have but the kingdom? So you can see this is a big a turning point. So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Now exactly when... Um, the timing of this is, but I think it's, it, it is a huge turning point when he's chasing David that brings out a lot of other bad behaviors. Anybody have one bad habit that brings out a lot of other ones? You know, or something that they're just, just a pet peeve that just makes me mad every time they say this and, you know, it brings on other things and the way I think about things. And, and I think this is the, the story here. And I, you know, it, it makes us think about our lives, and I think that's what all this is. We, we know how wonderful God is and how he keeps working with us. But these things, you know, the biggest problem I have in life is me, right? I'm the big, biggest problem that there is when it comes to living my life because I, you know, I always say hopefully I'll never get what I deserve, but, you know, God has been good, and, you know, those things are constantly put in front of me um, to help me. And I think I always used to joke all the time is that, you guys don't really realize the reason you're here is because God's trying to convert me and bring me along through this. And years ago, I said that to Roger Tippmann, and um, he said, that, "No, no, no, no! You got to go back out in the world. If we are all just together all the time, and you know, we'll probably get sick of each other. Maybe I don't know, but um, you know, we have to go out in the world and use these things that we've learned. And I'll never forget. I was a young. Our children were young at that time when he said that, and I've appreciated those words. Have stayed with me. Can't tell you what year it was, but. So, um, 
Saul is spared by David, and we'll talk a little bit of these stories, and then I want to get into the final battle and a little bit of what happens. Um, and I think Brother um, uh, John covered that very well yesterday. You know, one of the things that I really appreciate, too, for those, uh, you know, as we try to walk along um, with those who we're talking about, I think, you know, walking around uh, with Brother Glenn's talks, to walk along with the first century church is very much of what it would have been like in Saul's life that um, if you disagreed, you're going to die. And so many people way before us who walked in the first century fighting all the evils that were going on at that time, when you walk with them, you realize really how blessed we have been. And, you know, we don't know whether there's going to continue there, but certainly we should be able to stand up to anything. And I think that's the one thing that, you know, the message is up from God this weekend. So the first time that, um, and, and again, you can see this throughout, but the first time that David um, spares Saul's life, and I'm not going to go into the whole story because you probably know it, but I'm going to try to get you as close as I can by telling it. But So now it happened when Saul returned from following the Philistines um, that I was told him that David was in the wilderness in, Get in Gedi, and I was going to put some maps up, but in Gedi's down, uh, down on the Salt Sea, and... Um, so Saul has to travel some distance, as best as I can tell, he was up in the Gibeah area when he comes back. And uh, he, he gets uh, his 3,000 men, uh, chosen men, 3,000 men to go catch David. That's quite, a, um, quite an army to go after one person, don't you think? Of course, he's got to contend with David's fighting men, so he's got to be ready. So David and his men uh, were on the rocks. Um, on the rocks of the wild goats. I'm not sure I can explain exactly what that is. So he came to the sheep holes uh, by the road where uh, there was a cave. And this is Saul was. And um, um, Saul comes to the cave. And we remember this story. Saul went in to attend to himself. And David and his men were hiding in the recess of that cave. So you, you, you've heard this story a bunch, right? So he's hiding in the recess of the cave. And then the men of David... And this is really an interesting thing to, and again, while we're not necessarily coming David, it, it certainly shows David's heart and why God loved him, you know, for our sake, for learning. It says, Then the man of David said to him, This is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David rose, arose and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. So that's a kind of a popular thing. We'll see that in um, we see that in Saul's life when he's running from, or, or Samuel turns and walks from him. We talked about it yesterday, and he grabs his robe and tears it. And Samuel says to him, "You know, the kingdom has been torn from you." So anyhow, he cuts the corners of Saul's robe. He doesn't um, do anything. So we jump to verse eight, and David also rose afterward, and, and he was feeling bad, so he went out of the cave. And called out to Saul, saying, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped um, with his face to the earth, and he bowed down. So you can get this picture. You know, Saul comes out of the cave, and in that cave was the very man he was seeking to kill. And, of course, you can just imagine all those thoughts going through Saul's head. Um, jumping down to verse 10, it says, Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered me. And this is where I think... God is preaching through David to Saul. Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord deliver you today into my hand in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you, but my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, and he is, for he is the Lord's anointed. So you know his men were trying to encourage him to kill Saul. I mean, there wasn't a better opportunity, was there? He was right there, could have ended it, could have ended a lot of his problems. Um, but he doesn't. And I think this is the part, at least my feeling is, God is preaching through David um, to Saul, trying to get him to change. And, and, and again, this is the part where he seems, uh, the part that you, we may even look at our own lives, how he seems to change for a little bit, but then that determination that's in him um, continues to be his downfall. And he says, Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. Uh, for in that I cut off the corner of your robe, and, and I did not kill you, so know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand. For I have not sinned against you, yet you hunt my life 
to take it. So you can see David maybe pleading for his life, but I think it's the opposite. If I was Saul hearing these things, I should be listening close to what he's saying. Um, and then verse 15 says, Therefore the Lord, let the Lord be, our, uh, the, be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. So again, who is he preaching? The Lord. Um, he's reminding him that God is in charge of all this stuff um, and that um, their lives are truly in God's hands. So it was when David had finished, and this is the part where you see a little bit of uh, Saul's, um, you know, Saul says, okay, is that your voice? David and Saul lifted up his voice, and Saul lifted up his voice, and he wept. So he's like me, he's a big crybaby. But he, he, he weeps, um, and uh, you can just imagine there could be many reasons why he weeps, but he certainly is moved that David doesn't kill him, he had the opportunity to kill him, uh, he could be thinking about the things back that he knows better than to do this. Um, and and he, then Saul says to David, you are more righteous than I, and you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. So he's, again, um, preaching. If Saul is listening and trying to work on his heart, then um, he has a chance to, to make a serious change. And you have shown this day how you have dealt with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. For when the Lord delivered you into my hand, you did not kill me. And I don't think there's um, a thing that should impact us more when we realize ourselves that, um, you know, this could have just happened and it didn't, you know, make a change. So for if, for if a man finds his enemy, and this is Saul still speaking to him, um, and gets away safely. Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And I think that's the the. Um, to me, Saul seems very humble at that point. He seems like he could be making a change. Um, and now I know indeed that you shall surely be king. And this is Saul speaking to him, the kingdom of Israel, and shall be established uh, in your hand. And we know if you go back. Saul, uh, da uh, Saul wanted to kill David because um, his family wouldn't continue on, and he, you know, one of his obsessions was to kill David so his family would continue on in the king, uh, running the kingdom, if you will. Um, but then Saul asked David, and, and actually David um, abides by this if you go and study them. Therefore, swear now to me that the Lord, that you will not cut off my descendants after me that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. So, um, you know, he's pleading with them to not um, get rid of him, right? So David swore to Saul, and Saul went home, and David went, and his men went to their stronghold. So, you know, so to me, this is could be a better, uh, more humbling experience to realize when God just gave your enemy the chance to kill you, uh, he didn't, um, that should change us, right? Things like this in our life, that should change us, does it? That's the stuff that always worries me. So the second time, um, it, the one thing, if the map was up, you can see Saul travels pretty far to get, um, to get David. It's not like, you know, hey, let's run over around the corner and there's David hiding behind the house and let's go get him. It's, you know, there's some distance and, you know, to get 3,000 men together um, is something. He, he seems to be stuck on 3,000. Not sure what that means, but... So he goes to the Ziphites, um, uh, came to Saul at Gibeah and saying, David is hiding in the hills and Saul arises and he goes down to the wilderness of Ziph having 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness as if. So here's the second time after he just went through all that. Um, Life-changing experience. And it doesn't change him, does it? He doesn't stop that determination. So to me, that's the thing that I walk away with as one of the things is you know, to recognize that in ourselves. So David arose and came to the place um, where Saul was encamped, and again, I'm jumping ahead, 
uh, they come into the camp and David arose and he goes to the place where the Saul was encamped. And this is always in the story. Maybe I'd be better off telling it. So he goes um, and Saul's men are camped. And, uh, and during that night, um, they send spies over, see where they're at, see where Saul's sleeping. Um, and then the, the, the uh, next night, David asked for the men to, uh, what men would go with him. And of course, those men were eager, eager as well to kill Saul. And uh, God puts the entire group into a deep sleep. And um, sitting next to um, Saul is his spear by his head and a jug of water. And David come, is able to come in. They actually have a conversation in front of him. Um, that would be very much like my wife. I can walk in, turn the blow dryer on, the lights on. She doesn't wake up. You just go, and I'm wide awake. I can wake right up. So, so meanwhile, God has him in a deep sleep. And um, so Saul's laying there, and he had the chance to kill him. And he does it again. So David took the spear and the jug of water, which to me is so ironic to realize that he was right there with me, right? Another life-changing experience. And, and I think in verse 12, right, so, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. So that always makes me think that God really did deliver him into his hands. And he had a choice. So we'll jump ahead here and again try to cut out some of the story. And then Saul uh, knew David's voice and said, is that your voice, my son David? And David said, it's my voice, O king. And he said, Why does the Lord thus pursue this ser his servant? For what have I done? And what evil is um, in my hand? And we're going to look a little bit at um, when Saul, I didn't have that in there, but I hopefully we'll look at a few minutes of Saul uh, killing the priests and what, what he has the chance to make a change um, there as well. So now, therefore, please let the Lord, the Lord, my Lord the King, hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, if it's your guys saying this, your <coughs> army, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out um, this day from sharing uh, in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. And we know that he actually goes down, David goes down to... Uh, um, Ziklag, right? So he actually goes down with the Philistines and actually begins to fight with them, which again is a whole other story. And verse 20 says, So now don't let, um, do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, right? So he brings these 3,000 men to seek this guy as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Kind of an interesting saying, I looked at that a little bit, it's just like, this is so little, what are you doing? You know, you didn't need to bring even all this, this army. And Saul said, I have sinned. And again, here's his chance. He, he says the right things. I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more, because my life is precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. So sort of what John was saying yesterday, right? He failed at every point. Here was a, a perfect point. He says it himself. He sees what happened, and he's try, and, and again, he speaks the right words, but, and that truly is a lesson for us in our own minds. And David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let one of your young men come over and get it. Right? And may the Lord repay every man uh, for his righteousness and his faithfulness. <coughs> For the Lord delivered you into my hand, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And I, again, and I feel very strongly that God, again, continues to preach to Saul. He doesn't give up on him. Indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord. Right? And let him deliver me out of all the tribulation. Because... God took very good care of David, we know, throughout his whole life, and truly took care of Saul. Saul just did, couldn't make the turn. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. And we 
remember what he said last time, he'll be a great king, um, but he didn't really mean it, it would appear by the way he acts. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. So I can tell you if you study, and we don't, I don't have this here, but um, Saul would have gone after him again. But David goes down to Ziklag, he gets out of there, and that's when Saul finally says, okay, David's gone, I don't have to worry about him anymore. And that's really, and still I think there would have been a third or fourth, but David leaves and he goes down there. He was so, de right, determination is, is helpful at times, correct? But determination going after the wrong things is very unhelpful. That's such a word, very unhelpful. We'll add that to the dictionary if it's not there. So this is one I, I just wanted to touch on, but it's very hard to just touch on this. Um, the Edomite, uh, Saul had an Edomite who was his chief herdsman, and who, were the Ed who was Edom? Esau, right? So Edom is um, obviously of the same family, but not the person you should be selecting, I think. This bears this out. What I think, what, the reason I tell the story, it makes you think about the friends, the people you choose to be around, um, is very important. So, this, well, let me just get into it here. So, so Doeg the Edomite um, is what he's referred to as Doeg and Edomite, Doeg the Edomite, was Saul's chief herdman and over the, over his servants. So, David um, came to Nob. Uh, to Ahimelech, and this is the, the to me this is a, such a tragic story, and I don't know about you guys, but, but when something goes bad in the movie, I'm, I always like, I wish they wouldn't have put that in there, and this is a story that I just wish would have never happened, because it's just terrible. So David goes to Nob, and at the end of this, David takes responsibility for the priest being killed here, but Ahimelech's a priest, they live in Nob, and again, uh, the priest gives David bread. And remember, Christ talks about this, right? You know, when the, before the Pharisees and Sadducees, you guys worry about this. What did, um, this very thing is quoted by Christ, that, that he goes to the priest and he gets the bread, right? And, um, you know, that's talked about later on. I didn't bring that up here, but um, if you remember, the, if you look at the story. Now, there's a certain man, the servants of Saul was there that day, so... David's in Nob with the priests, and it says that um, uh, Doeg here is detained before the Lord. That's kind of an interesting comment. Um, and his name was Doeg an Edomite, the chief of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. So David's there, and what do you think somebody who wants to get elevated to the king would do? Tell him, right? You know, turn him in. To, you know, go tell something that pleases the king and. Maybe he'll do something good to me. And so David tells the priest, and I, I really abbreviated this trying to cut it down. David tells the priest um, he did not have any weapons. And if you remember, that's when the priest says, the only weapon I have here is um, Goliath's um, sword you know, that you took. You can have that. And so David goes off. And that's the part of the story where David leaves. And here's the part... Um, so Saul says to his servants, and again, if you read this whole story, he was very upset. He's preaching to his team saying, who, who can David, the son of Jesse, give you land? And uh, you know, just like a king, right? So can he give you all these things? He's trying to, trying to create loyalty and get somebody um, to get this David. He's still, he's still after him, right? So Saul says to his servants, all have conspired against me. Um, and then verse 9, and then this is where Doeg tells us, Doeg the Edomite. Am I, what, how would you actually say that? Doeg, am I even saying that word? You know? Not a big deal. Uh, who was set over the servants of Saul? And I saw the son of Jesse um, there in Nob uh, to Ahimelech. So, so Doeg's telling him that he saw him with Ahimelech. And um, then he, that, and that he inquired of the Lord for him. And again, they, uh, at this point, Saul's cut off from God is not speaking to him through prophets um, directly. So um, Samuel's out of, out of the way. And so he gave him a sword of Goliath. So just one more thing to irritate Saul, that um, he actually inquires of the Lord. So what does Saul do? He says, bring me Ahimelech. And to me, this is sort of, you know, when you're a king, you're a judge, right? So uh, we know in David's life, you know, where people would come, Moses, you know, they would come. 
and uh, get things settled by them. So this feels like a, a, a trial. So the king said uh, to call Ahimelech, uh, Ahimelech and the priest and the son uh, and the son of Ahim, or the priest, sorry, he goes, he calls Ahimelech and, and all his father's house and the priests who were there at Nob and they all came to the king. So the king summoned them there and here they come um, to him. And verse 13 says, Then Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse? And if you read the verses before this that we're skipping, and I, I want to make a point here, um, he, he conspired, or why, do you, why do you do this and that? You have given bread and a sword, and have inquired of God for him, um, that he should rise up against me, and to lie in wait, as it is to this day. So all these things Saul saying to the priest, all made up in his head, um, again, another thing we have to be careful of. So Ahimelech answers the king, and I, I didn't have this in there originally, but I added it because this is Ahimelech preaching to Saul too, saying, don't you realize that David is the most faithful servant you have? He's gone, he's battled, he's your son-in-law, for God's sake, if you may say, in today's world, right? Um, he goes and he does your bidding from your house. We know his whole entire life it was. So Saul's hearing this from Ahimelech. Is Saul listening? Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? So we know in the story of Ahimelech, he doesn't even know that he thinks that he's on the actual business of, and I didn't start out with that, but he, he doesn't even know that he's not on Saul's business. Um, he was afraid when he got there. And who among your servants is as faithful as David? Sorry, and then you, for your servant do nothing at all um, of all of this, little or much. So Ahimelech's telling him, I, I didn't even know that he was that he wasn't on a mission for you. And what does Saul say? So here's here's the judge sitting there, if you will, um, and he he gives a verdict, and he says, and the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And to me, it's just terrible sad. And I think having the right friends is critical for us because and the right people that are around us because I think of the story of Abigail and David. What did Abigail save David from? Killing all the men of Nabal and he even says it. Thank you Abigail. If you had to come down before me um, and save me from going to kill them that blood would have been on my hands. And so, um, very much the story feels very similar to that. It says, Then the king said to the guards who stood about them, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord. And what do they do? They won't do it. They just won't kill um, the priests of the Lord. They know better, and they don't do it. That's who we need around us. People who stop us from doing um, evil, right? We need that feedback. We need somebody to come say something to us. Oftentimes, well, I don't want to offend them, but in this case, it's better to save them, correct? So I'll try to remember that when you come to me and say that. So, um, so Doeg's there, and Saul turns to Doeg and says, kill him, and he does. He kills 85 men, 85 priests there, and then he goes... And he goes to the, all their families and kills um, the men, women, children, nursing infants, oxen, donkeys, sheep with the edge of the sword. And so I don't want to leave you down, but I, I, I think there's not a greater story that um, not only was Saul uh, struggling in his own mind, he had people around him that would have made it, made it even worse. Instead of having the right people around them to hear the right stuff, because what is that saying? You know, if your arm right arm can't defend you, cut it off, right? Don't, you know, it's all that's sort of that whole story. It's it, you know, these stories are the same throughout, not the same. They're told in different ways throughout the scriptures. So, um, if Doak had not have been there, he might have been saved from killing the priest. So I I think that is such a great and it's an, un, it's, a, it's an unfair trial. It was predetermined before he even came in, right? It, it's about the most unfair trial any person or group could have. 
and what a terrible tragedy that this happened. And so this is this blood is on Saul's hands. Saul killed the priest. Well, he didn't physically do it, just like David puts Uriah in front of it. God said, "You killed him, right?" So that's just this is just one of those things in the movie I wish wasn't there, but it is. So. Um, Seven minutes, okay. We're not going to get through this very well, but I, I think um, uh, I think John did a great job describing this yesterday. But there's a couple things in this um, that I think are very touching about how some people felt about Saul. Because I really believe, if you read through that, that Samuel really cared a lot about Saul and wanted him to succeed, and as he should. Um, you want your king to succeed once he's, you know, made the decision and you get through all the things, but um, so the, the final battle is, you know, it starts in chapter 28 and then it skips over, there's some stuff about David and then finishes at 31, chapter 31 and we know that's where Saul and his three sons die, that's what um, uh, John talked about yesterday so I'm, I'm going to skip through here um and I want to get to the end. So, so meanwhile, the battle's arranged. This is when Saul goes to uh, the witch of Endor that John talked about, right? So he goes there. And I love that story. Yesterday, um, when I was working on this, and, I would, I, and now every time I read that story, I just burst out laughing when it says that she screamed you know, you're running this fake business, and there's a movie called Ghost. Anybody ever see that? And so Whoopi Goldberg's the one she's got this fake business going on, right? And somebody really comes up. She's startled because she's hearing this voice, right? And so I read that, and I just burst out laughing. And, uh, you know, I, luckily nobody heard me from the other room. But it's just so hilarious that you think about it. Here's Samuel actually comes up, and um, is there. She's never seen that before. So I just find that I've been laughing uh, since then. So anyhow, um, the Philistines finally, you know, they're there, he goes up, he knows he's going to die. Samuel says, you're going to be down here with me, you're going to be dead, and your three sons. And yet he still goes to battle, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, he didn't seem to give up, although they fleed, and this was inevitable. God was going to finally take him out. So the Philistines chased Saul and killed his sons. Um, and again, another part of the story that's tragic is his sons. And what they face, and you know, the story of Jonathan and David, there's not a better one. You can imagine how David feels, and we know that, and once it just goes over into 2 Samuel, and again, I don't know if there's a book divide there, I always think about that, because, you know, it seems to just keep going right on. Um, and the Philistines chase Saul and his sons, and they kill him, um, and Saul's hit by the archers, and severely wounded, and thanks, and um, his armor bearers, um, Sorry, and Saul's, he's severely wounded. His armor bearer would not kill him. You know, he, Saul asked him to kill him, and Saul finally falls on the sword, and, um, and you know, whatever that happens to look like. Maybe we don't need a picture of what that looks like, but, you know, it just, I, I think about um, it. But the, the story that strikes me is, do you remember his first battle? Who the first battle was with? He goes up to Jabesh Gilead, right? Symbols all. That's when he cuts up the oxen, sends it there. They gather um, and they go over and they rescue Jabesh Gilead. And at the very end, um, and I'll skip to it here. And verse 11. So Saul's dead. They go, as John described very well yesterday. They take their bodies, their armor. They cut off their head. They mount them up in their idol's temple. And if you look at where that is. That isn't very far. So here's the battle, and here's where that is, and Jabesh Gilead is somewhere here. So the, so the, so the, right there. The, um, the Philistines were very intertwined with them, um, and I think that was happening during Samuel's time. It's just God kept them at bay. He never, they never were aroused until Jonathan did that. So, um, so that night, the, the, valiant men of Jabesh Gilead hear about this and they actually go into the town overnight and they go and take Saul's body and his son's bodies and armor and bring it back uh, which is very interesting. We were talking a little bit about this with uh, 
with Glenn, right? So they, they came to Jabesh Gilead and burned them there. So you can just imagine what it might have been a pretty gory scene. Um, and they took their bones and buried them under a tamarisk tree at, at Jabesh and fastened and fast in seven days. And you know, I think about um, the very beginning of Saul's first battle and he freed them. I think they would have a special place in their heart for Saul. And so to wrap this up, um, in, in First Chronicles, at the very end of it, it talks about the same battle. There's nothing there that I find that's any different than what is written in 28 and 1 Samuel. But the way that God writes in 1 Chronicles, it says, So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. I mean, just as Brother John brought up, one failure after another, right? Just kept, while God kept working with him, he starts out okay, he seems to come along, and then he fails. He comes along and he fails, and, and probably sometimes we can relate to that. It says, But he did not acquire of the Lord, therefore he killed him. So this was God um, taking care of it and finally turned the kingdom over to David and the son of Jesse. And we know that as it moves into the David, you know, slowly takes over and comes in as king. So it's a tragic end um, to me for one of God's most preached to people. Sorry. Not for sure I was going to get through this. Um, but God really worked with him, and I think I feel the same way about me. Brad, are you in here? you got to be up here when I'm crying, otherwise I don't feel great. That's how I get out of those things. Anyhow, I, I think the takeaway is God never gives up on us. Remember your first love and why you're here. Listen as you go about life. God's speaking to you. And I'm sure everybody here can attest to that. And watch who your friends are. Because somebody may not stop you from doing the wrong thing. Thank you.